Hello. I'm sorry I can't be with you in Harlinger. I wish it was possible, but at the moment it's not. But in this very short talk, I want to just explore some ideas around how educational research can help improve schools. I think there are two extreme views about educational research. At one extreme, we have the people who say that educational research is just done by researchers for, for their own interest and is completely irrelevant to the work of teachers. Teachers know what they're doing. At the other extreme, we have people who actually believe that educational research can tell teachers what to do. I don't think either of those two extremes is acceptable. I think without educational research, we would still be pursuing things like learning styles, the belief that if we teach children in their preferred learning style, they will learn more. There's absolutely no evidence that's true and some evidence that it's false. Programs like Brain Gym, which were very popular in the 1990s, would actually still be being pursued because there was no evidence it didn't work. At the other extreme, we have this idea that we can actually make education, teaching in particular, into something a bit more like physics. The idea is that educational research would tell teachers what to do. And I don't think that's ever going to be possible. I think the nature of teaching, the nature of classrooms, means that educational research can never tell teachers what to do. And I think the work of Robin Hogarth here is very interesting. He talks about kind learning environments, where what you learn in one context is usually applicable in another context, and wicked learning environments. And I think teaching is a wicked learning environment. For example, things that work in one context don't work in another context. The reason we think something works turns out not to work somewhere else. And that's why I think educational research will never tell teachers what to do. But it can help them identify some best bets, the things that are most likely to be helpful in improving student achievement. And in doing that, I want to suggest that really, if we want to actually harness the power of educational research to help teachers, and leaders to make better decisions about where to put their efforts, I think there are five questions we should ask about any piece of research. The first question is this, does it solve a problem we have? We now know, for example, that children, students make more progress if their teachers are more knowledgeable about the subject they teach. But that research is irrelevant if the teachers in your school are already very knowledgeable about the subject. So the first question is, does it solve the problem we have? The second question is, how much extra achievement will we get if we do this? And in the past, people have talked about effect sizes. The problem with effect sizes is that effect sizes are really combining things that shouldn't be combined. In fact, effect sizes are justifiable only when they're unnecessary. If we compared two different ways of teaching, say, mathematics, by like giving all the students the same test, we wouldn't need an effect size. We could just use the test score and see if one method produces a bigger gain than the other method. We need effect sizes when we use different tests to test a particular idea. And then we need to be sure that the different tests we're using are testing the same thing which we never know to be true. So effect sizes are justifiable only when they're not needed because you've got the same test. That's why how much extra achievement will we get should be answered with extra months of learning per year. How many extra months of learning per year will we get if we do this? And researchers say this is very difficult. Yes, it is, but it's the only thing that actually matters because any improvement in educational processes manifests itself as an increase in the rate at which students learn. The third question is, how much will it cost? And when people hear that, they automatically assume that I'm talking about money, and I'm not. The most important cost is teacher time and student time. I've come to the conclusion that opportunity cost is the single most important concept in education improvement. Because every hour that teachers and students spend on one thing is an hour they don't have to spend on something else. 
So question three, how much will it cost in money? Sure, but also in teacher time. Question four is, can we implement it here? So for example, several experiments have shown that when you actually have smaller classes, students make more progress. A classic example here is the Tennessee Star Study that found that when children were taught in smaller classes at the age of five and six, that could be detected in their high school graduation rates 12, 13, 14 years later. If they'd been in the smaller classes, they were 11 percentage points more likely to graduate high school. But here's the problem. Reducing class size might work, it's expensive, but it might work if you have a plentiful supply of teachers, which they did in the Tennessee Star Study. But other places have tried to implement the same idea, and because teacher recruitment was challenging, they've ended up giving jobs to people who shouldn't be teaching. So the problem is, class size reduction can work in some contexts and not in others. Can we implement it here? The last question, do we know what to do? And this is why I think that much of the research synthesis that goes on is actually not that helpful. So people talk about an effect size for feedback. But the problem is, plenty of research shows that some feedback lowers student achievement. And if you don't understand what kinds of feedback increase student achievement, then it's just saying we need to do more feedback might actually make things worse. Collaborative learning is claimed by some to have an effect size of 0.4. But what does it mean to do collaborative learning? It turns out that most people, when they hear about collaborative learning and try to implement it in their own classrooms, don't do the things that the research suggests are necessary for collaborative or cooperative achievement, cooperative learning to improve achievement. So this, I think, is really important. We need to actually understand what the experiment said. And that's why I think Research Ed is such a powerful organization, because it's about teachers finding out about the research, finding out what it says, and then using their own professional judgment to say, okay, well, was that research done with students like mine? Was it done in schools like mine? Were the people using assessment instruments that are the same as my students will have to sit? And that's why these five questions are a starting point, but only as far as actually helping teachers engage in a critical in inquiry in the research. That's why every single teacher needs to be a critical consumer of educational research. Research will never tell you what to do. But by critically looking at the research, does it solve a problem we have? How much extra achievement will we get? How much will it cost? Can we implement it here? And do we know what to do? Then teachers can maximize the likelihood that their efforts to improve their practice will benefit their students. Thank you.